the people who are here. There's uh, apparently something going on at the South Church, so some of us uh, who are normally here may be over there today. We want to um, have our thoughts remain with them as they are traveling to and fro. But uh, if you would, stand with me. We're going to turn to 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to read our scripture verse today. First John 1 John 1.1 That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Let us pray. Father God, we, I ask for your blessing upon me today as I speak your message that you have given me. Lord, we ask that the, the angels come in between us here today to keep the evil ones away. Let your spirit go between my lips and the hearer's ears today, Lord. Let us garner from your word what you would have us hear. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Remember, next week, we're going to start Sabbath school at 9.30, so please be here for that. We're going to be in here in the sanctuary. And uh, uh, Pastor Farmer is going to be preaching for the last time here at church next week, so looking forward to that. But today, the book of 1 John, or more properly, the first epistle of John, is a letter by, which, it, by most scholars, is attributed to the apostle John that most beloved of the disciples who was there at the crucifixion. We can see that in John 19, 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, he took that, he that, hour, that disciple took her to his own home who was the brother of James. Together, they were referred by Jesus as the sons of thunder, probably due to their zeal, as shown by the time they asked Jesus if they could call fire down on a Samaritan village. You can see that in uh, Luke 9.51. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up. I'm sorry, that's not right. Nine... 51, 54, sorry. <clears throat> and, when he, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Now this same man, who is a bold defender of the faith, is writing this book, or so most scholars would have us believe. And there are many good reasons to believe this. Neither, John, neither of John's general writings have an introduction in the sense of naming him as the author like other uh, writings, by, or writings by other apostles. John leads out talking about the word straight away. And we want to note here that John is the only author or writer that uses this construction of word as referring to Jesus. If we compare the Gospel of John, uh, the first verse in the Gospel of John to the first verse in 1 John, we can see the similarities straight away. The Gospel of John starts out, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And 1 John starts out, as we've already seen, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. Not only this language, not only the language employed between the, gospel, uh, between the gospels throughout, <clears throat> sorry, not only this, but the language employed by the gospels throughout and the three epistles attributed to, attributed to him have striking similarities. These parallelisms in wording and construction we find are often easy to miss in the English and are more impressive in the Greek. Yet, they are so similar we can see them if we look for them. So many things can be brought up in the defense of the idea that John is the author of this book, uh, that the whole sermon could be about that. But I'm just gonna give you a, a quick, quick example. Several of the first 
century Christians after the apostles quoted from these, these letters as, they were all, as though they were all written by one person. You have people like Polycarp, Barnabas, Clement of Rome, Papias. Arrhenius, writing in 180 AD, actually says that they were written by John. <clears throat> but, I'm, but we must move on from here, and I'm satisfied through my study that indeed John the Apostle did write this book. Now, 1 John is not a letter like 2 John and 3 John. It is a general letter and is therefore classified as an essay since it has no direct receiver, meaning it wasn't written to anyone in particular. And we can gather from the subject matter written about it is written to Christians, not to non-Christians or to unbelievers. For example, if you look just in chapter 2 of 1 John, verse 1, it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if we take for granted that John the Apostle is writing this essay, and we will, when, where, and why is it being written? Now, the essay itself doesn't contain the answers to any of these directly. So we must infer, on the, based on the contents, the answers to our questions. And if we take just the essay itself, we can conclude, conclude, conclude that 1 John was written by an older person who was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, as we will soon see. Now, the when is harder to determine, but it seems to have been written well after the Gospels, and in response to a movement known as Gnosticism. And I'll talk about Gnosticism a little bit more in a minute, but Gnosticism was not a, a different religion or a, a, a different church. It was a trend in belief system within the church. Now, the primary purpose for 1 John is pastoral. John writes lovingly to his spiritual children that they may better, be better able to live a Christian life. The keynote of the letter is love. The setting is a simple yet profoundly spiritual exhortation. God is love, chapter 4, verse 8. Love is of God, verse 7. God loved us and sent his Son, therefore we ought to also love one another verse 10 and 11. But this theme is set against the backdrop of opposition, which gives it a polemical as well as pastoral aim. By polemic, I just mean there was a controversy he was talking about or addressing. Now, the, now the ideas that John is fighting against in this essay, as I've said, is a type of Gnosticism or hidden knowledge known as docetism and Serentianism. These heresies involved ideas about the nature of Christ. Docetism denied the reality of the incarnation and taught that Christ only appeared to have a human body. And the other, Serentianism, believed that Christ entered the body after his birth and left before he was crucified. John refers to both to these people as both false prophets and antichrist. So keep these ideas in your head as we read the book. And we're going to go phrase by phrase through the first verse. And you should be there, but if you're not, go ahead and turn to 1 John 1.1 1, 1, and we'll start. That which was from the beginning... Note here that John is using a neutral pronoun, that which was, instead of he who was, to refer to Christ, him, <clears throat> sorry, instead of he who was, to refer to Christ himself as a response to the Gnostic belief that the, in the nature of Christ. He's saying to them, whatever that was in the beginning, you say Jesus is this, and I say whatever that was. He's bypassing their argument. Many times we attempt to do, many a times, we must attempt to do this when talking with others about Christ. We must bypass their arguments and get to the heart of the matter at hand. 
For example, if you're trying to witness to a person, and I'll just give you a, a, a good example of something I might do. If you're getting resistance from them, you could ask them a few questions. Ask them, for instance, have you ever lied? <clears throat> then you're a liar. Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Then you're a thief. Have you ever looked upon someone with lust in your heart that you're not married to? Then you're an adulterer. Have you ever hated someone? Then according to scriptures, you have murdered them. So by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterous murderer. And if Jesus would return right now, do you know what the scriptures says would happen to you? You're going to die. And you will deserve it as I do. But I turned my life to him. I accepted his sacrifice in my place and I follow him. We must get past the mind blocks into the heart. It's not manipulation. It's getting past the roadblocks. And this was what John was doing. Now this neutral pronoun he uses not only in this verse, but in other verses to also um, refer to uh, people. So it's not an isolated thing for him. Um, again, back with the scripture. That which was from the beginning. Now here he is making a reference to this, a similar idea he set forth in, in the gospel of John. In the beginning. The difference here is instead of talking about Jesus at the beginning and before, as in the gospel of John, he's referring to Jesus from the beginning and afterwards. He's simply establishing, excuse me, establishing that Jesus was that which was in the beginning. In this phrase, he is looking straight at the Serenthianist and those today who may have a similar of opinion and say that Jesus is the same as whatever it was that was in the beginning. Now, before I move on, I must say that we have these people today that deny the reality of Jesus or construe or bend the truth of it out of focus. The Serenthianists believe in the utter evil of the flesh and decided that because the flesh was evil, that there's no way that God, God could actually become human, only that he entered a human and that because God could not die, that he must have left before the crucifixion. It's only logical. But my friends, if Christ didn't actually die on the cross, then we're lost. We have no hope. We're dead. But praise God, it's not true. Many atheists have this similar opinion that Jesus didn't actually exist. Modern spiritualists also teach the unreality of the material world. When I was younger, there was a group that became known as, the, uh, as Heaven's Gate. It was a group led by a man named Marshall Applewhite and a lady Bonnie, uh, named Bonnie Nettles. And over the years, they took on several different names, uh, among them Bo and Peep and T and Doe after a musical scale. The group was founded in 1974. And Marshall, together with Bonnie, taught that the earth was going to be recycled in 2027, which isn't far from now. But in order to escape this recycling, they must leave the earth in a spaceship, originally in their bodies. But after Bonnie died in 1985, Marshall changed their beliefs so that it fit the available data that they had. And this is how they got the idea, or they get the idea, that the body is a vehicle. And that instead of joining the ship in your body, at some point they must shed their bodies. To board the ship. In 1995, two scientists discovered a comet they named after themselves Hellbop. And in 1996, a theory came about that there was a spaceship in the tail of the Hellbop comet. After Chuck, Chuck Schrameck took a fuzzy picture of the comet, and in the picture it showed a, a, an elongated object nearby the comet. And this was promoted on the radio broadcast Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. And Marshall seized upon this theory and settled, I'm sorry, and started preparing the group to be transported on the ship. And, it, and many of you probably remember in San Diego, California, on March 26, 1997, all but two members committed a mass suicide. That's 39 people lost their lives to this errant belief. 
If you're thinking maybe Marshall killed them, but I, I watched the exit tapes that they made. These people believed wholeheartedly in what they were doing. If only we had as much faith in our beliefs as they had in theirs, we would change the world. But people say aberrant beliefs don't harm people. Let people believe what they want to believe. It's dangerous, my friends. The idea of the eternality of the soul, meaning a soul living as a separate entity from the flesh, that dates from Satan's lie in the garden. You shall not surely die. Yes, people, you will die. The lie repeated in the Christian belief of once saved, always saved. You shall not surely die. The soul doesn't go on. This soul will die either when the body is transformed at his coming or when we die our earthly death. At that moment, at his coming, we will receive a different body, a renewed soul. You do not exist without your body. You will be in heaven with the body or you will be cast into the lake of fire in your body. Dare to be burned till you no longer exist. It's dangerous to think anything else, my friends. We must repent of those evil ways. We must turn and stop sinning. We must follow the word. We must follow that which was from the beginning. Let's return to the text. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Which we have heard. John is laying... It, John here is laying into the idea that the docet has had that Jesus didn't have a fleshly body. That he was some kind of apparition or ghost. Note the word here, akakoamen, in the Greek. It's in the perfect tense. And that indicates that it was a completed action that had an ongoing effect. So when John says, that which we have heard, he's saying, that which we have heard and is still with us. Or in other words, that which we have heard and is still hearing. Whatever that was, John says, whatever that was in the beginning, we heard it and it's still with us. Are you still hearing that which was in the beginning? We must hear from him. His words must remain in us. We must akakoamen. I can imagine John at some point saying, A ghost? An apparition doesn't speak as Jesus spoke or breathe the way he, we heard him breathe or rustle the ground when he walks. We, we know as Adventists, there are no such things as ghosts. I see many shows like Ghost Hunters <laughs> where they are searching for imaginary things. I've been caught up in it myself. Not because I think it's real, but because I think it's fascinating to watch people chase things that aren't real and be totally scared at the same time. We know the truth behind it all. It's either it's fake or it's demonic activity. Do not be deceived by reports of ghostly hauntings. Just as Jesus was no ghost, there are no ghosts in the graveyard. These type of beliefs, these types of belief can and will quickly lead you astray. You must stay far from it. Let's continue. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and we have looked upon. Other translations say gazed upon or contemplated. The idea that we saw him, but not only did we see him, we studied him. We watched him. We saw him eat. We saw him drink. We knew his mother and brothers. And if you've ever been on, a, on an extended hike, you, you'll understand when I say John may have wanted to say we smelled him. We were there when he took a bath. And he goes on. And our, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And our hands have handled we touched the wound in his side. We touched the wounds in his hands. If this was indeed the disciple, the apostle John, he would have said, 
I laid my head on his chest. I remember a scripture where people who were talking about Jesus said, did our, did our hearts not beat when we heard him speak? And John says, this was no ghost. This was the word of life. The same word that I told you about in my gospel is the same one in the beginning with the Father. The one who is the same as God, the perfect mirrored image of God, his son, Jesus the Christ. My friends, today we must recognize that whom John is speaking about. The question before us, the reality of Jesus. What is the reality of Jesus? John says it was who he heard, who he saw with his eyes, as if there's another way of seeing. Who he studied, who he touched. That was the same in the beginning with the Father. The word of life. Jesus asked his disciples at one point, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, because, you know, Peter was so quick to always have a word. You are the son of Christ, the son of the living God. And in another place, when many turned away from him at a certain time, he turned to the twelve and he asked them, Will you leave me as well? And again, Peter, being so quick with his word, said, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I ask you today, who do you say that he is? Will you follow the Gnostics then and now in their beliefs? Will you say Jesus didn't come in the flesh? Remember, anyone who says that Christ did not come in the flesh, that is the Antichrist. Will you surround yourself with their errant beliefs, such as once saved, always saved, or the internality of hell, or fall into some cultish beliefs like the Heaven's Gate group that harms you and others? And as some of our modern films would like us to say, or the ideas that come from them, are we just luminous beings waiting to shed our flesh so that we can be holy again? Was Jesus not real or some ghost? No. John says no. Whatever it was, we heard it. We saw it. We studied it. We handled it with our hands. Whatever it was in the beginning, whatever that was, is the word of life. Because of the reality of Christ, we were changed. And we were persecuted and killed. Now John is the only apostle that had not been successfully killed by the enemies of Christ. Oh, they tried. Tradition has it that they put him into, a, into boiling oil, but he survived with no injury. And after that, they exiled him to the island of Patmos. Where he may have written this letter, but for sure wrote the book of Revelation... Peter and Paul, they were both killed in Rome. Paul beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified in Russia. Thomas died somewhere in the east, being stabbed through with spears. Philip was put to death in Rome. Matthew stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew had some unreported cruel death. James, John's brother, the son of Alphaeus, stoned and then when that didn't work, they clubbed him to death. Simon the Zealot killed in Persia. Matthias burned, in, burned to death in Syria. They knew the reality of Jesus Christ. They were with him before the crucifixion. And they were with him after the resurrection. They went to their deaths claiming what they saw. They wouldn't have done that for a ghost. For a lie someone believes was the truth, a man might die. 
We see that zeal in Islam where they will blow themselves up for their faith. But no man that I know of, unless they're mentally ill or something, I'm not sure, but no man's going to blow themselves up for a lie they know to be a lie. No one's going to die for something like that. Jesus is no cunningly devised fable, as Paul says. When you meet the reality of Jesus in the flesh, he will change you. And as he says, as well in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You will become a new creation. You can today take hold of this. Maybe you're here today and have been coming to church your entire life. But the Spirit is speaking to you today. And you have realized while listening to John's pleading in that verse that you have never been made a new creation. Don't leave here today without getting that settled in your heart. I'm here for you. I will pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you've never been baptized and want to follow Christ in his example. Speak to someone. We can get that done. Maybe you're here or new here and want to find out more about us. After service, find me, talk with me. We'll figure that out. Maybe, you're, maybe you've been created new at some point. But lately things aren't feeling exactly right. Maybe the shutdowns and the situations going on in the world have you down. Maybe you are saying to your, maybe today you're saying to yourself, I can't struggle through anymore. And this was your last chance today to find someone, something worth living for. I beg you, friends, let's talk. We can work through that. I love you. Maybe you've been at church your whole life and have always been a good Christian. But the power of the gospel has been gone so long in your life that you don't even know if it has power anymore. Maybe you just want to rededicate your life to Christ today so that you can receive the power that is promised in his word. I promise you, friends, the time is near. The end is nigh even at the door. I look outside and fall is upon us. And I look on the world, and Jesus is in the distance. We may wake tomorrow with a shout and a blast of the voice of God. How wonderful would that be? And if you don't take time today, as he says in his scripture, today is the day of salvation. Today, get that right. If you don't get it done today, you'll be lost if that happens. And now I'm not going to ask you to come down. I'm not going to try to embarrass you anyway. But if, if any of these, please, if any of these are true of you, please talk with me. We'll work through these things. We can work together and find God together. Remember, if you're a liar, an adulterer, a murderer, a thief, a blasphemer, if any of these are true today or have ever been true of you, and you haven't turned your life to Christ, you haven't submitted yourself to him, then we need to get that taken care of today. Don't walk out those doors. There is no tomorrow. Here at Shreveport First, we're a family. I care about you. Every one of you sitting here. Don't leave your standing unsure. Now, if you would like to rededicate your life to God today, please stand. You can stand if you want to. We're going to pray. And if... <clears throat> Father God, today we ask that we want to dedicate our lives to you from here forward. We no longer want the past. We want a break from that. We want a new future. For us, not only us, but the entire world, as we go forward from here, Lord, we ask that you will be in us and around us to help us influence those that we come in contact with. Lord, save us from this body of death. Don't let us leave here without, without having our standing sure with you. Help us to obey you, Lord, to, 
to, to have that relationship with you, to always remember to pray every day to you so that we may garner that relationship in a better way. Thank you, Lord, for the people that are here, that have heard this, and that may hear it later or might be on the live stream. Lord, Father, we, we are grateful to you for being our God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you.